All right, welcome everyone to today's scenario rapid recap, where we are looking a little bit into the recent Nucleus 13 issue that was uncovered earlier this week. My name is Chad Holmes, and I'll be walking you through this for the next few minutes. At a high level, let's start with Nucleus 13 at a glance. So it was disclosed earlier this week on November 9th, um, and it impacts Nucleus real-time operating systems, or RTOSs, that are created and distributed by Siemens. And we'll talk a little bit about more about Siemens and how they've reacted in a very good way as we go throughout this presentation. The attack impacts TCP IP stacks. Um, these are the latest in a long line of recent vulnerabilities on TCP IP stacks with kind of interesting names like NameRec or Ripple 20 or Amnesia 33. And of course, those lead to the questions of why the number 13 or why the number 20 or 33. Um, and it comes down to the number of vulnerabilities that are actually discovered in these attacks. So in this case, we have Nucleus 13 because it was a set of 13 vulnerabilities discovered, uh, the most critical of which uh, has the title of CVE 2021-31886, which is kind of a standard naming convention uh, uh, for CVE. And that one in particular is very, very bad. Um, it allows for things like remote code execution um, and on a, uh, a 10 scale has a 9.8 CVSS score, which means really high likelihood, uh, um, really critical exploit, uh, um, really bad impact if it is exploited. So on a scale of 10, that's about as high as you're gonna see uh, um, for something you know, this nasty. If you wanna learn more about this, we are publishing more details on our blog. So you can follow that QR code, code up in the right or go to uh, scenario.com and go to our threat intelligence blog. And we'll have a lot more detail about Nucleus 13. The question we get out of a lot of these attacks is why are TCP IP stacks so attacked? Why you know, are all these issues coming out? And the reality is kind of that because TCP IP is a standard stack in most communication protocols, there are other protocols out there, but TCP is, is one of the, the core standards. Most manufacturers have developed their own uh, uh, custom TCP IP stack that they've tested over time. And most are incredibly solid. Occasionally issues pop up like this, but for the most part, we can trust in these TCP IP stacks. They're a family of protocols for communication. Um, they're reused throughout many devices, almost every device, right? It's not just med tech devices, although they're in a lot of med tech devices, but they're in phones and computers and in everything else that has some kind of communication protocol. What this means is when I'm connected to a patient monitor or UR or whoever is, you know, nurses can rely on the communication going back and forth between the monitor and their nursing station uh, um, or a million other uses to make sure that it's some kind of reliable communication. That's what TCP IP offers. But because TCP IP stacks are reused, it means that there's goods and bads that come with it. One is reuse of those components because they have become so reliable, allow for quicker development, not just of software and hardware, but kind of all technology, right? If you look at uh, any device, there are often hundreds or thousands of different components, even the smallest devices out there, um, that are reusing all, the, all these different stacks and technologies and libraries and, and, and everything else that goes into them. So that means that we have a lot, more, a lot quicker development. But it also means that when there's an issue within a stack or any of the other components, it can lead to widespread vulnerabilities. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. It's really important to note though, that the reward of this reuse far outweighs the risk that it introduces. Yes, it stinks when we have an issue like the one that we're seeing today. But we are able to create more devices that are kind of miraculous. They allow for greater treatment. They allow for better quality of life. That far outweighs the risk that they introduce. And it's worth noting that, right? Yes, this stinks, but overall we're better off uh, because of that reuse. If you want to learn more kind of about stacks um, um, and how they're reusing components and what that introduces and, and the benefits of it, uh, I invite you to look at our recent talk, How Old, the, how old Devices Haunt Modern Healthcare. Um, we talk about that as well as some of the older devices that are out there that are actually introducing risk into healthcare systems. So if you want to dive deeper down this path, you're, you're more than welcome to there. Or of course, you can always reach out to us. Back to Nucleus 13, though, they, it has a very real impact, um, particularly on the medical community. Um, first of all, it's impacting 3 billion, with a B, and you can see that on the right there, devices worldwide. And, and I would guess it's probably more than that at the end of the day. And it's impacting both medical and non-medical devices. So First, we're seeing things like ventilators, patient monitors, anesthesia machines, and hundreds of other types of devices that have this vulnerability built in, right? It's just kind of the nature of reusing those TCP IP stacks. 
But we're also seeing things like operations technology, uh, heating and cooling systems, HVACs, lighting, fire alarms. If you think of hospitals as just big buildings that need facility management in place and use technology to do that, they're using the same stacks that, that, that other devices are, and they're susceptible to the same attacks. Meaning a lighting system that's managed from a computer may introduce risk to healthcare environments, um, which is kind of weird to think about. We know that one exploit, right? So if there's even one kind of crack in the armor here, will allow for attacks like malicious code execution and denial of service attacks. And what that translates into in the real world is disrupted medical care, patient diversion, ransomware attacks, data theft, um, pretty much all the bad things you hear about ha happening to hospitals, attackers are going to use their new knowledge about uh, this vulnerability to try and to attack it. Now, I do want to leave with a little bit of good news, so I'm going to go opposite order here. I'm going to do bad news, then good news first. So a little bit continued bad news. Obviously, there's the wide, widespread impact here. We don't know what the vendor patch times are going to be. Um, the good news that we'll get to in a second, Siemens has issued a patch for this, so I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, a little bit more bad news, we know that the risk reduction process around this does take time. You have to identify the devices, you have to prior, prioritize them, you have to execute, execute the actual patches and fixes. That takes time, right? To some degree, that just requires humans going and updating thousands and thousands of devices. Um, we also know that this may put uh, um, some operational uh, organizations and some patients at risk, right? If there is a breach, Hopefully there's not, but if there is a breach or an attack on these, it could lead to hospitals being shut down or patient care uh, being impacted in some way. And again, we have some talks on that coming up that, that uh, I'd recommend you take a look at next week. The good news though, and I mentioned this earlier, Siemens patches are available, right? Siemens has been outstanding around this issue. It was identified by researchers, they disclosed it. Siemens found a patch, they released a patch incredibly quickly. This is the exact behavior we want to see out of uh, uh, technology manufacturers like this, right? Siemens has done everything they can to possibly resolve this issue. Security issues are going to get up, uh, come up. Bugs are going to come up anytime you're creating technology. We have to accept that. It really comes down to how companies are reacting to that. And Siemens has kind of been perfect here, right? They released a patch. They worked with the researchers. They got it out there. They educated people. Awesome job. We do know that because those patches are going to take a while, though, because those remediation efforts take time, that there's some middle ground where we need to mitigate the issues. We need to reduce the likelihood of attack. And that's through doing things like networking segmentation, where you, you put the devices in their own little segment on a hospital network, you harden their services so it limits the communication uh, outbound to, to things outside the network. Um, and then we, we need to monitor traffic to make sure if there is an attack of some sort, we can catch that internally. And as you might imagine with a scenario video, we can do that. Uh, so the first thing we do is we have attack detection response where we go back and we're monitoring the traffic for malicious activity. And when we detect that malicious activity, we're able to identify the device it's coming from, where it's communicating, and the best approach to actually uh, uh, addressing that device. Sometimes it's taking it offline. Sometimes it's isolating because you can't take things like MRI machines offline very, very easily. But we do have a service that will help with malicious activity if it is going on in your network. Really important point there. Most of these attacks don't happen over a, a matter of seconds and minutes. They happen over a, a matter of months and quarters. So we have some time for detection and response, but the sooner we can get to it, the better. We also have a bunch of network rapid risk reduction approaches we can take to help you mitigate these issues be, uh, as you're working towards a full remediation, full patch that we talked about earlier. First, we do work to segment networks with customers. Um, this used to be an incredibly heavy lift. It would require a lot of really skilled IT folks, a lot of time to actually identify the segments and place devices in those segments uh, through policies. Um, we actually are able to analyze that automatically and create the policy rules that you can then push to uh, um, your networking tools uh, um, to do so. We have a lot of people that are concerned it's going to have functional impact when we do that, which makes perfect sense. So we also have segmentation analysis, meaning we will analyze the rules and policies we create against live traffic before we push that live. So we can see if there are any clashes that we have to uh, address before we push that. So that's a really, really nice benefit to be able to analyze the policies before, before going to production. Really, really good best practice you should always follow. Next is we have service hardening. So I talked about earlier, if a device is reaching to an outside network or if thousands of devices are, we wanna make sure that what they're reaching out to uh, um, is necessary and controlled so we can harden the services 
uh, of where they are reaching out and making sure that it's only necessary communication. And then finally, we also have vendor access controls. A lot of vendors are reaching into your, your environments through secure channels, right? It's supposed to happen. They're maintaining their devices, they're upgrading their devices, but sometimes they do that in an overly permissive way. So we wanna identify uh, um, those vendor access channels, make sure that they only have the level of access they need, no more, no less. Don't impact them functionally, but make sure that if they are breached in some way, that breach does not become your breach either. So if you wanna learn more, you can always go to Scenario. Um, we are on LinkedIn, Twitter, Right Talk, YouTube, uh, Asana, all kinds of different spots. You can find us, you can get us at scenario.com, scan the QR code. Um, if you have any questions for me specifically, chad.homes at scenario.com. Thank you for attending today. Hopefully this was helpful. And if you are afraid of the Nucleus 13 issue, if you have questions about it, let us know. We'll be happy to, to get our team on the phone.